Welcome to Gina's Book Nook. I'm so excited to share a new book with you. Um, it's one of my favorites. If you are an animal owner, have ever owned an animal before, I think you will appreciate this book. I read this book once when I was visiting my uncle in Marfa, Texas, and it was his book, and he told me, you've got to read this. Now, he was the owner of four beagles, and we called him the Pied Piper because those dogs followed him everywhere. It's called The Story of Edgar Sawtell by David Robleski. And let's just get right into it. Each of these readings, I'm going to keep them to about an hour. I know, I know that that seems kind of long, you can stop at any time you want, or you can just keep going. Um, it is kind of a big book, but I, I am just, ah, oh, let's get into it. I'm so excited. A Handful of Leaves. In the year 1919, Edgar's grandfather, who was born with an extra share of whimsy, bought their land and all the buildings on it from a man he'd never met, a man named Schultz who in his turn had walked away from a logging team half a decade earlier after seeing the chains on a fully loaded timber sled let go. 20 tons of rolling maple buried a man where Schultz had stood the moment before. As he helped unpile logs to extract the wretched man's remains, Schultz remembered a pretty parcel of, of land he had spied north, of west, north and west of Mellon. The morning he, he signed the papers, he rode one of his ponies along the logging road to his new property and picked out a spot in a clearing below a hill and by nightfall a workable pole stable stood on that ground. The next day he fetched the other pony and filled a yoked cart with supplies and the three of them walked back to his crude homestead. Schultz on foot, reins in hand, and the ponies in harness behind as they drew the cart along and listened to the creak of the dry axle. For the first few months, he and the ponies slept side by side in the pole shed, and quite often in his dreams, Schultz heard the snap when the chains on that load of maple broke. He tried his best to make a living there as a dairy farmer. In the five years he worked the land, he cleared one 25-acre field and drained another, and he used the lumber from the trees he cut to build an outhouse, a barn, and a house in that order so that he wouldn't need to go outside to tote water. He dug his well in that hole that would become the basement of the house. He helped raise barns all the way from Tannery Town to Park Falls so there'd be plenty of help when his time came. And day and night he pulled stumps. That first year he raked and harrowed the south field a dozen times until even his ponies seemed tired of it. He stacked rocks at the edges of the field in long humped piles and burned stumps in bonfires that could be seen all the way from Popcorn Corners, the closest town. If you, call, if you could call that a town, and even melon. He managed to build a small stone and concrete silo taller than the barn, but he never got around to capping it. He mixed milk and linseed oil and rust and blood and used the concoction to paint the barn and outhouse red. In the south field, he planted hay, and in the west, corn, because the west field was wet and the corn would grow faster there. During his last summer on the farm, he even hired two men from town. But when autumn was on the horizon, something happened. No one knew just what. And he took a meager early harvest, auctioned off his livestock and few, ar few farm implements, and moved away, all in the space of a few weeks. At the time, John Sawtell was traveling up north with no thought of it or intention of buying a farm. In fact, he had put his fishing tackle into the kissel and told Mary, his wife, he was delivering a puppy to a man he'd met on his last trip, which was true as far as it went. What he didn't mention was that he carried a spare collar in his pocket. That spring, their dog, Violet, who was good, who was good but wild-hearted, had dug a hole under the fence when she was in heat and run the streets with romance on her mind. They ended up chasing a litter of seven around the backyard. He could have given all the pups away to strangers, and he suspected he was going to have to. But the thing was, he liked having those pups around. 
liked it in a primal, obsessive way. Violet was the first dog he'd ever owned, and the pups were the first pups he'd ever spent time with, and they yapped and chewed on his shoelaces and looked him in the eye. At night, he found himself listening to records and sitting on the grass behind the house and teaching the pups odd little tricks they soon forgot while he and Mary talked. They were newlyweds, or almost. They sat there for hours and hours, and it was their finest time so far in his life. On those nights, he felt connected to something ancient and important that he couldn't name. But he didn't like the idea of a stranger neglecting one of Vi's pups. The best thing he would be it, it, the best thing would be if he could place them all in the neighborhood so he could keep tabs on them, watch them grow up, even if from a distance. Surely there were half a dozen kids within an easy walk who wanted a pup. People might think it peculiar, but they wouldn't mind if he asked to see the pups once in a while. Then he and a buddy had gone up to the Sh Shequamega. I hope I'm saying this right, guys. Chequamanga, Chequamangan, Chequamangan, let's say that's it. A long drive, but worth it for the fishing. Plus, the Anti-Saloon League hadn't yet penetrated the North Woods and wasn't likely to, which was another thing he admired about the area. They'd stopped at the hollow in Melon and ordered a beer, and as they talked, a man walked in followed by a dog, a big dog gray and white with brown patches, some mix of a husky or shepherd or something of that kind, a deep-chested beast with a regal bearing and a joyful jaunty carriage. Every person in the bar seemed to know the dog who trotted around greeting the patrons. That's a fine-looking animal, John Sawtell remarked, watching it work the crowd for peanuts and jerky. He offered to buy the dog's owner a beer for the pleasure of an introduction. Name's Captain, the man said, flagging down the bartender to collect. With beer in hand, he gave a quick whistle and the dog trotted over. Cappy, say hello to the man. Captain looked up. He lifted a paw to shake. That he was a massive dog was the first thing that impressed Edgar's grandfather. The second thing was less tangible. Something about his eyes. The way the dog met his gaze. And, gripping Captain's paw, John Sawtell was visited by an idea, a vision. He had spent so much time with pups lately, he imagined Captain himself as a pup. Then he thought about Vi, who was the best dog he had ever known until then, and about Captain and Vi combined into one dog, a pup. Which was a crazy thought because he had far too many dogs on his hands already. He released Captain's paw. And the dog trotted off and he turned back to the bar and tried to put that vision out of his mind by asking where to find Muskie. They weren't hitting out at Clam Lake and there were so many little lakes around. The next morning they drove back into town for breakfast. The diner was situated across the street from the Mellon Town Hall, a large squarish building with an unlikely looking cupola facing the road. In front stood a white three-tiered drinking fountain with a bowl at person height, another lower for horses, and a small dish near the ground, whose purpose was not immediately clear. They were about to walk into the diner when a dog rounded the corner and trotted nonchalantly past. It was Captain. He was moving in a strangely light-footed way for such a solidly constructed dog, lifting and dropping his paws as if suspended by invisible strings and merely paddling along for steering. Edgar's father stopped in the diner's doorway and watched. When Captain reached the front of the town hall, he veered to the fountain and lapped from the bowl nearest the ground. Come on, his buddy said, I'm starving. From along the alley beside the town hall came another dog, trailing a half dozen pups behind. She and Captain performed an elaborate sachet, sniffing backsides and pressing noses into ruffs while the pups bumbled about their feet. Captain bent to the little ones and shoved his nose under their bellies and one by one rolled them. Then he dashed down the street and turned and barked. The pups scrambled, scrambled after him. In a few minutes, he had coaxed them back to the fountain, spinning around in circles with the youngsters in hot pursuit while the mother's dog stretched out in, on the lawn and watched, panting. A woman in an apron walked out the door of the diner, squeezed past the two men and looked on. That's Captain and his lady, she said. They've been meeting there with the kids every morning for the last week. 
ever since Violet's babies got old enough to get around. Whose babies? Edgar's grandfather said. Why, Violet's. The woman looked at him as if he were an idiot. The mama dog. The dog right there. I've got a dog named Violet, he said, and she has a litter about that age right this moment back home. Well, what do you know, said the woman, without the slightest note of interest. I mean, don't you think that's sort of a coincidence that I'd run into a dog with my own dog's name and with a litter the same age? I couldn't say. Could be that sort of thing happens all the time. Here's a coincidence. Happens every morning, his buddy interjected. I wake up, I get hungry, I eat breakfast. Amazing. You go ahead, John Sawtell said. I'm not at all hungry that way. And with that, he stepped into the dusty street and crossed to the town hall. When he finally sat down for breakfast, the waitress appeared at their table with coffee. If you're so interested in those pups, Billy might sell you one. He can't hardly give them away and there's so many dogs around here. Who's Billy? She turned and gestured in the direction of the sit, at, of the sit down counter. There on one of the stools sat Captain's owner, drinking a cup of coffee and reading the Sentinel. Edgar's grandfather invited the man to join them. When they were seated, he asked Billy if the pups were indeed his. Some of them, Billy said. <coughs> Sorry. Cappy got old Violet in a fix. I've got to find a place for half the litter. But what I really think I'll do is keep them. Cap dotes on him, and ever since my scout ran off last summer, I've only had the one dog. He gets lonely. Edgar's grandfather explained about his own litter and about Vi, expanding on her qualities, and then he offered to trade a pup for a pup. He told Billy he could have the pick of Vi's litter, and furthermore, could pick which of Captain's litter he'd trade for, though a male was prefer preferable if it was all the same. Then he thought for a moment and revised his request. He'd take the smartest pup Billy was willing to part with, and he didn't care if it was male or female. Isn't the idea to reduce the total number of dogs at your place, his buddy said. I said I'd find the pups at home. That's not exactly the same thing. I don't think Mary's going to see it that way. Just a guess there. Billy sipped his coffee and suggested that while interested, he had, he had reservations about traveling practically the length of Wisconsin just to pick out a pup. Their table was near the big front window, and there, John Sawtell could see Captain and his offspring rolling around on the grass. He watched them a while, then turned to Billy and promised he'd pick out the best of Vi's litter and drive it up, male or female. Billy's choice. And if Billy didn't like it, then no trade. And that was a fair deal. Which is how John Sawtell found himself driving to Mellon that September with a pup in a box and a fishing rod in the back seat, whistling shine on harvest moon he'd already decided to name the new pup gus if the name fit billy and captain took to vice pup at once the two men walked into billy's backyard to discuss the merits of each of the pups in captain's litter and after a while one came bumbling over and that decided things john saw tell put the spare collar on the pup and they spent the afternoon parked by a lake shore fishing Gus ate bits of sunfish, roasted on a stick, and they slept there in front of a fire, tethered collar to a belt by a length of string. The next day, before heading home, Edgar's grandfather thought he'd drive around a bit. The area was an interesting mix. The logged-off parts were ugly as sin, but the pretty parts were especially pretty, like the falls and some of the farm country to the west, most especially the hilly woods north of town. Besides, there were few buildings that he liked better than steering the, the Kissel along those old black roads. Late in the morning, he found himself navigating along a heavily washboarded dirt road. The limbs of the trees meshed overhead, left and right. Thick underbrush ob obscured everything farther than 20 yards into the woods. When the road finally topped out at the clearing, he was presented with a view of the Pinocchi Range, rolling out to the west and an unbroken emerald forest stretching to the north all the way, it seemed, to the granite rim of Lake Superior. At the bottom of the hill stood a little white farmhouse and a gigantic red barn. A milk house was huddled up near the front of the barn and untopped, an untopped stone silo stood behind. By the road, a crudely lettered sign read, For Sale. 
He pulled into the rutted drive and he parked and got out and peered through the living room window. No one was home. The house looked barely finished. He stomped through the fields with Gus in his arms and when he got back he plunked himself down on the running boards of the Kissel and watched the autumn clouds soar above. John Sawtell was a tremendous reader and letter writer. He especially loved newspapers from faraway cities. He'd recently happened across an article describing a man named Grego Mendel, a Czechoslovakian monk of all things, who had done some very interesting experiments with peas. He had demonstrated, for starters, that he could predict how their offspring of his plants would look, the color of their flowers, and so on. Mendelism, this was being called, the scientific study of heredity. The article had dwelt upon the stupendous implications for the breeding of livestock. Edgar's grandfather had been so fascinated that he had gone to the library and located a book on Mendel and read it cover to cover. What he had learned occupied his mind in odd moments. He thought back on the vision, if he could call it that, that had descended upon him as he shook Captain's paw at the hollow. It was one of those rare days when everything in a person's life feels connected. He was 25 when every, uh, 25 years old, but over the course of the last year, his hair had turned steely gray. The same thing had happened to his grandfather, yet his father was edging up on 70 with a jet black mane. Nothing of the kind had happened to either of his elder brothers, though one was bald as an egg. Nowadays, when John Sawtell looked into the mirror, he felt a little like a Mendelian P himself. He sat in the sun and watched Gus, thick-legged and clumsy, pin a grasshopper to the ground, mouth it, then shake his head with disgust and lick his chops. He'd begun smothering the hopper with the side of his neck when he suddenly noticed Edgar's grandfather looking on, heels set in the dirt driveway, toes pointed skyward. The pup bucked in a mock surprise as if he'd never seen this man before. He scrambled forward to investigate, twice going tail over tea kettle as he closed the gap. It was John Sawtell thought a lovely little place. Explaining Gus to his wife was going to be the least of his worries. In fact, it didn't take long for the fuss to die down. When he wanted to, Edgar's grandfather could radiate a charming enthusiasm, one of the reasons Mary had been attracted to him in the first place. He could tell a good story about the way things were going to be. Besides, they'd been living in her parents' house for over a year, and she was as eager as he to get out on her own. They completed the purchase of the land by mail and telegram. This the boy Edgar would come to know because his parents kept their most important documents in an ammunition box at the back of their bedroom closet. The box was military gray with a big clasp on the side and it was metal and therefore mouse proof. When they weren't around, he'd sneak it out and dig through the contents. Their birth certificates were in there along with a marriage certificate and the deed and history of ownership of their land. But the telegram was what interested him the most a thick yellowing sheet of paper with a Western Union legend across the top. Its messaging cons- its message consisting of just six words glued to the backing in strips. Offer accepted. See Adam Adamski R.E. Papers. Adamski was Mr. Schultz's lawyer. His, his signature appeared on several documents in the box. The glue holding these words to the telegram had dried over the years, and each time Edgar snuck it out, another word dropped off. The first to go was papers, then R-E, then C. Eventually, Edgar stopped taking the telegram out at all, fearing that what, when accepted, fluttered into his lap, his family's claim to the land would be reversed. He didn't know what to do with the liberated words. It seemed wrong to throw them away, so he dropped them into the ammo box and hoped no one would notice. What little they knew about Schultz came from living in the buildings he'd made. For instance, because the Sawtells had done a lot of remodeling, they knew that Schultz worked without levels or squares, and that he didn't know the old carpenter's three, four, five rule for squaring corners. They knew that when he cut lumber, he cut it once, making do with shims and extra nails if it was too short. And if it was too long, wedging it in with at an angle. They knew he was thrifty because he filled the basement walls with rocks to save on the cost of cement. 
and every spring water seeped through the cracks until the basement flooded ankle deep and this Edgar's father said was how they knew Schultz had never poured a basement before. They also knew Schultz admired economy, had to admit it, it, it had to admire it to make a life in the woods, because the house he built was a miniature version of the barn, all its dimensions divided by three. To see the similarity, it was best to stand in the south field near the birch grove with the small white cross at its base, with a little imagination subtracting out the sh changes the sawtails had made, the expanded kitchen, the extra bedroom, the back porch that ran the length of the west side, you'd notice that the house had the same steep gambrel roof that shed the snow so well in the winter, and that the windows were cut into the house just where the Dutch doors appeared at the end of the barn. The peak of the roof even overhung the driveway like a little hay hood. Charming but useless. The buildings looked squat and friendly and plain, like a cow and her calf lying at pasture. Edgar liked looking back at their yard. That was the view Schultz would have seen each day as he worked in the field, picking rocks, pulling stumps, gathering his herd for the night. Innumerable questions couldn't be answered by the facts alone. Was there a dog to herd the cows? That would have been the first dog that ever called this place home, and Edgar would have liked to know its name. What did Schultz do at night without television or radio? Did he teach his dog to blow out candles? Did he pepper his morning eggs with gunpowder, like the voyagers? Did he raise chickens and ducks? Did he sit up nights with a gun on his lap to shoot foxes? In the middle of winter, did he run howling through the rough track town toward town, drunk and bored and driven out of his mind by the endless harmonica chord the wind played through the window sash? A photograph of Schultz was too much to hope for, but the boy, ever inward, imagined him stepping out of the woods as if no time had passed, ready to give farming one last try. A compact, solemn man with a handlebar mustache, thick eyebrows, and sad brown eyes. His gait would swing roundly from so many hours spent astride the ponies, and he'd have a certain grace about him. When he stopped to consider something, he'd rest his hands on his hips and kick a foot out on its heel, and it'd whistle. More evidence of Schultz opening a wall to replace a rotted-out window, they found handwriting on a timber in pencil. Twenty-five and a quarter plus three and a quarter equals twenty-eight and a half. On another beam, a scribbled list. Lard, flour, tar, five gallons, matches, coffee, and two pounds of nails. Edgar was shocked to find words inside the walls of his house, scrawled by a man no one had ever seen. It made him want to peel open every wall, see what might be written along the roof line, under the stairs, above the doors. In time, by thought alone, Edgar constructed an image of Schultz so detailed he needn't even squint his eyes to call it up. Most important of all, he understood why Schultz had so mysteriously abandoned the farm. He'd grown lonely. After the fourth winter, Schultz couldn't stand it any more. Alone with the ponies and the cows and no one to talk to, no one to see what he had done or listen to what had happened, no one to witness his life at all. In Schultz's time, as in Edgar's, no neighbors lived within sight. The nights must have been eerie. And so Schultz moved away, maybe south to Milwaukee or west to St. Paul, hoping to find a wife to return with him help clear the rest of the land, start a family, yet something kept him away. Perhaps his bride aboard farm life, perhaps someone fell sick. Impossible to know any of it, yet Edgar felt sure Schultz had accepted his grandfather's offer with misgivings. And that, he imagined, was the real reason the words kept falling off the telegram. Of course, there were no reason to worry, and Edgar knew that too. All that had happened 40 years before he was born. His grandfather and grandmother moved to the farm without incident, and by Edgar's time it had been the Sawtell place for as long as anyone could remember. John Sawtell got, got work at the veneer mill in town and rented out the field Schultz had cleared. Whenever he came across a dog he admired, he made a point to get down and look it in the eye. Sometimes he cut a deal with the owner. He converted the giant barn into a kennel, and there Edgar's grandfather honed his gift for breeding dogs. 
dogs so unlike the shepherds and hounds and retrievers and sled dogs he used as foundation that they became known simply as sawtell dogs. And Mary and John Sawtell raised two boys as different from one another as night and day. One son stayed on the land after Edgar's grandfather retired to town, a widower, and the other son left, they thought, for good. The one that stayed was Edgar's father, Gar Sawtell. His parents married late in life. Gar was over 30, Trudy a few years younger, and the story of how they met changed depending on whom Edgar asked and who was within earshot. It was love at first sight, his mother would tell him loudly. He couldn't take his eyes off me. It was embarrassing, really. I married him out of, really out of a sense of mercy. Don't you believe it, his father would shout from another room. She chased me like a mad woman. She threw herself at me every chance she got. Her doctor said she could be a danger to herself unless I agreed to take her in. On this topic, Edgar never got the same story twice. Once they'd met at a dance in Park Falls, another time she'd stop to help him fix a flat on his truck. No, really, Edgar had pleaded, please. The truth was, they were longtime pen pals. They'd met in a doctor's office, both of them dotted with measles. They'd met in a department store at Christmas, grabbing for the last toy on the shelf. They'd met while Gar was placing a dog in Wausau. Always, they played off each other, building the story into some fantastic adventure in which they shot their way out of danger on the run to Dillinger's hideout in the North Woods. Edgar knew his mother had grown up across the Minnesota border from Superior, handed from one foster family to another, but that was about all. She had no sisters or brothers, and no one from her side of the family came to visit. Letters addressed to her sometimes arrived, but she didn't hurry to open them. On the living room wall hung a picture of his parents taken the day a judge in Ashland married them. Gar in a a gray suit, Trudy in a knee-length white dress. They held a bouquet of flowers between them and bore expressions so solemn Edgar almost couldn't recognize them. His father asked Dr. Papineau, the veterinarian, to watch the dogs while he and Trudy honeymooned in Door County. Edgar had seen snapshots taken with his father's brownie camera the two of them sitting on a pier, Lake Michigan in the background. That was it, all the evidence, a marriage license in the ammo box, box, a few pictures with wavy edges. When they returned, Trudy began to share in the work of the kennel. Gar concentrated on the breeding and whelping and placing while Trudy took charge of the training, something that no matter how they'd they'd met, she shined at. Edgar's father freely admitted his limitations as a trainer. He was too kind-hearted, too willing to let the dogs get close to performing a a command without getting it right. The dogs he trained never learned the difference between a sit and a down and a stay. They'd get the idea that they ought to remain approximately where they were, but sometimes they'd slide to the floor, take a few steps, and then sit, or sit up when they should have stayed down, or sit down when they should have stood still. Always, Edgar's father was more interested in what the dogs chose to do, a predilection he had acquired from his father. Trudy changed all that. As a trainer, she was relentless and precise, moving with the same crisp economy Edgar had noticed in teachers and nurses, and she had singular reflexes. She could correct a dog on lead so fast she'd burst out laughing to see it. Her hands would fly up and drop to her waist again in a flash, and the dog's collar would tighten with a quiet chink and fall slack again, just that fast. Like watching a sleight of hand trick. The dog was left with a surprised look and no idea who had hit the lead. In the winter, they'd use the front of the cavernous hay mow for training. Straw bells arranged as barriers, working the dogs in an enclosed world bounded by the loose scatter of straw underfoot and the rough-hewn ridge beams above, the knotty roof planks, a dark dome shot through with with shingling nails and pinpoints of daylight, and the crisscross of rafters hovering the middle heights, and the whole back half of the mow stacked ten, eleven, twelve high with yellow bales of straw. The open space was still enormous. Working there with the dogs, Trudy was at her most charismatic and imperious. Edgar had seen her cross the mow at a dead run, grab the collar of a dog who refused to down, and bring it to the floor. 
all in a single balletic arc. Even the dog had been impressed. It capered and spun and licked her face as though she had performed a miracle on its behalf. Even if Edgar's parents remained playfully evasive on the subject of how they had met, other questions they answered directly. Sometimes they lapsed into stories about Edgar himself. His birth, how they had worried over his voice, how he and Almondine had played together from before he was out of the crib. Because he worked beside them every day in the kennel, grooming, naming, and handling the dogs while they waited turn, while they waited turns for training, he had plenty of chances to sign questions and wait and listen. In quieter moments, they even talked about the sad things that had happened. Saddest of all was the story of that cross under the birches in the south field. They wanted a baby. This was the fall of 1954, and they'd been married three years. They'd converted one of the upstairs bedrooms into a nursery and, brought, and bought a rocking chair in a crib with a mobile and a dresser all painted white. And they moved their own bedroom upstairs to the room across the hall. That spring, Trudy got pregnant, and after three months, she miscarried. When winter came, she was pregnant again, and again she miscarried at three months. They went to a doctor in Mansfield who asked what they ate, what medicines they took, how much they smoked and drank. The doctor tested his mother's blood and declared her perfectly healthy. Some women are prone, the doctor said. Hold off a year. He told her not to exert herself. Late in 1957, his mother got pregnant a third time. She waited until she was sure and then a little longer in order to break the news on Christmas Day. The baby, she guessed, was due in July. With the doctor's admonition in mind, they changed the kennel routine. His mother still handled the younger pups herself, but when it came to working the yearlings, willful and strong enough to pull her off balance, his father came up to the, to the mow. It wasn't easy for any of them. Suddenly, Trudy was training the dogs through Gar and he was a poor substitute for a leash. She sat on a bell shouting, Now! Now! in frustration whenever he missed a correction, which was quite often. After a while, the dogs cocked an ear toward Trudy even when Gar held the lead. They learned to work the dogs three at a time, two standing beside his mother while his father snapped the lead onto the third and took it through the hurd hurdles, the retrieves, the stays, the balance work. With nothing else to do, his mother started simple bite and hold exercises to teach the waiting dogs a soft mouth. Days like that, she left the mow as tired as if she'd worked alone. His father stayed behind to do evening chores. That winter was especially frigid, and sometimes it took longer to bundle up than to come cr to cross from the kennel to the back porch. In the evenings, they did dishes. She washed, he dried. Sometimes he put the towel over his shoulder and wrapped his arms around her, pressing his hands against her belly and wondering if he would feel the baby. Here, she'd say, holding out a steaming plate, quit stalling. But reflected in the, ref in the frosty window over the sink, he'd see her smile. One night in February, Gar felt a belly twitch beneath his palm. A hello from another world. That night, they picked a boy name and a girl name both counting backwards in their heads and thinking that they had passed the three-month mark but not daring to say it out loud. In April, gray curtains of rain swept across the field. The snow rotted and dissolved over the course of a single day and a stream of vegetable odors filled the air. Everywhere, the plot plot of water dripping off eaves. There came a night when his father woke to find the blankets flung back and the bed sodden where his mother had laid. By the lamplight, he saw a crimson stain across the sheets. He found her in the bathroom, huddled in the clawfoot bathtub. In her arms, she held a perfectly formed baby boy, his skin like blue wax. Whatever had happened had happened quickly, with little pain, and though she shook as if crying, she was silent. The only sound was the damp suck of her skin against the white porcelain. Edgar's father knelt beside the tub and tried to put his arms around her, but she shivered and shook him off, and so he sat at arm's length and waited for her crying to either cease or start in earnest. Instead, she reached forward and turned the faucets and held her fingers in the water until she thought it was warm enough. She washed the baby sitting in the tub. 
The red stain in her nightgown began to color the water. She asked Gar to get a blanket from the nursery, and she swat, swathed the still form and passed it over. When he turned to leave, she set her hand on his shoulder, and so he waited, watching when he thought he should watch, and looking away at other times. And what he saw was her coming back together, particle by particle, until at last she turned to him with a look that meant she had survived it. But at what secret cost? Though her foster childhood had sensitized her to familial loss, the need to keep her family whole was in her nature from the start. To explain what happened later by any single event would deny either predisposition or the power of the world to shape. In her mind, where the baby had already lived and breathed, the hopes and dreams, at least, that, that made up the baby to her, was a place that would not vanish simply because the baby had died. She could neither let the place be empty nor seal it over and turn away as if she had never seen it. And so it remained, a tiny darkness, a black seed, a void into which a person might forever plunge. That was the cost, and only Trudy knew it, and even she didn't know what it meant or would ultimately come to mean. She stayed in the living room with the baby while Gar led Almondine to the workshop. Up and down the aisle, the dogs stood in their pens. He turned on the lights and tried to sketch out a plan on a piece of paper, but his hands shook and the dimensions wouldn't come out right. He cut himself with the saw, peeling back the skin across two knuckles, and he bandaged them with the kit in the barn rather than walk back to the house. It took until mid-morning to build a box and a cross. He didn't paint them because in that weather, it would have taken days for the paint to dry. He carried a shovel through the south field to the little grove of birches, their spring bark gleaming brilliant white, and there he dug a grave. In the house, they put two blankets in the bottom of the casket and laid the swaddled baby inside. It wasn't until then that he thought about sealing the casket. He looked at Trudy. I've got to nail it shut, he said. Let me take it out to the barn. No, she said. Do it here. He walked to the barn and got a hammer and eight nails and the whole way back to the house. He brooded over what he was about to do. They had set the casket in the middle of the living room. He knelt in front of it. It had turned out looking like a crate, he saw, though he had done the best he could. He drove a nail into each corner, and he was going to put one in the center of each side, but all at once he couldn't. He apologized for the violence of it. He laid his head against the rough wood of the casket. Trudy ran her hand down his back without a word. He picked up the casket and carried it to the birch grove, and they lowered it into the hole and shoveled dirt over it. Almondine, just a pup at the time, stood beside them in the rain. Gar cut a crescent in the sod with the spade and pounded the cross in the ground with the flat side of the hammer. When he looked up, Trudy lay unconscious in the newly greened hay. She woke as they sped along the black top north of Mellon. Outside the truck window, the wind whipped the fall rain into half shapes that flickered and twirled over the ditches. She closed her eyes, unable to watch without growing dizzy. She stayed in the Ashland Hospital that night, and when they danced, and when they returned the following afternoon, the rain still fell, the shapes still danced. It so happened that their back property line lay exactly along the course of a creek that ran south through the Shequamangan Forest. Most of the year, the creek was only two or three feet wide and so shallow you could snatch a rock from the bottom without getting your wrist wet. When Schultz had erected a barbed wire fence, he dutifully set his post down the center of the stream. Edgar and his father walked there sometimes in the winter when only the tops of the fence posts poked through the snowdrifts and the water made trickling marble clicking sounds, for though the creek wasn't wide enough or fast enough to dissolve the snow that blanketed it, neither did it freeze. Another time, Almondine tripped her head, tipped her head at the sound, fixed the source, then plunged her front feet through the snow and into the icy water. When Edgar laughed, even his silent laugh, her ears dropped. She lifted one paw after the other into the air while he rubbed them dry with his hat and gloves, and they walked back, hands and paws alike stinging. 
for, for a few weeks after each spring, the creek was transformed into a sluggish clay-colored river that swept along the forest floor for 10 feet on either side of the fence posts. Any sort of uh, thing might float past in flood season. Soup cans, baseball cards, pencils, their origins and mysteries, since nothing but forest lay upstream. The sticks and chunks of rotten wood Edgar tossed into the syrupy current bobbed and floated off all the way to the Mississippi. He hoped while his father leaned against a tree, he hoped while his father leaned against a tree and, and gazed at the line of posts. They saw an otter once floating belly up in the flood water, feet pointed downstream, grooming the fur on its chest, a little self-contained canoe of an animal. As it passed, the otter realized it was being watched and raised its head, round eyes, oily and black. The current swept it away while their gazes were locked in mutual surprise. For days after her return from the hospital, Trudy lay in bed, watching raindrops patter in the window. Gar cooked meals and carried them to her. She spoke just enough to reassure him, then turned to stare out the window. After three days, the rain let up, but the gray clouds blanketed the earth. Neither sun nor moon had appeared since the stillbirth. At night, Gar put his arms around her and whispered to her until he fell into a sleep of exhaustion and disappointment. Then one morning, Trudy got out of bed and came downstairs and washed and sat to eat breakfast in the kitchen. She was pale, but not entirely withdrawn. The weather had turned warm, and after breakfast, Gar talked her into sitting in a big overstuffed chair that he had moved out to the porch. He brought her a blanket and coffee. She told him as gently as she could to leave her be, that she was fine, and that she wanted to be alone. And so he stayed, Almondine on the porch, and so he stayed Almondine on the porch and walked to the kennel. After morning chores, he carried a brush and a can of white paint to the birches. When he finished painting the cross, he used his hands to turn the dirt where paint had dripped. The slow strokes of the brush on the wood had been all right, but the touch of the earth filled him with misery. He didn't want Trudy to see him like that. Instead of returning to the kennel, he followed the south fence line through the woods. Long days of rain had swelled the creek until it topped the second strand of barbed wire. He found a tree to lean against and absently counted the whirlpools curling behind the fence posts, the sight providing him some solace, though he couldn't have said why. After a while, he caught sight of what he took to be a clump of leaf litter twisting along, brown against the brown water. Then, with a little shock, he saw it wasn't a leaf litter at all, but an animal struggling and sputtering. It drifted into an eddy and bobbed under the water, and when it came to the surface again, he, he heard a faint but unmistakable cry. By the time he reached the, the creek water, the fence, the creek water was over his knees, warmer than he expected, but what surprised him most was the strength of the current. He was forced to grab a fence post to keep his balance. When the thing swept close, he reached across and scooped it from the water and held it in the air to get a good look. Then he tucked it into his coat, keeping his hands inside to warm the thing, and walked straight up through the woods and into the field house, into the field below the house. Trudy, sitting on the porch, watched Gar emerge from the woods. As he passed through a stand of aspen saplings, he seemed to shimmer into place between their trunks like a ghost, hands cradled to his chest. At first she thought he had been hurt, but she wasn't strong enough to walk out to meet him, and so she waited and watched. On the porch, he knelt and held out the thing for her to see. He knew it was still alive, because all along the walk through the field it had been biting weakly on his fingers. What he held was a pup of some kind, a wolf perhaps, though no one had seen one around for years. It was wet and shivering, the color of a handful of leaves, and barely bigger than his palm. The pup had revived enough to be scared. It arched its back and yelled and huffled and scrabbled its hind feet against Gar's calloused hands. Almondine pressed her muzzle against Gar's arm, wild to see the thing, but Trudy downed her sternly and took the pup and held it for a minute to look it over, then pressed it to her neck. Quiet now, she said. Shush now. She offered her littlest finger for it to suckle. The pup was a male maybe three weeks old, though they knew little about wolves and could only judge its age as if it were a dog. 
Gart tried to explain what had happened before he could finish the pup began to convulse. They carried it inside and dried it with a towel and afterward it lay looking at them. They made a bed out of a cardboard box and set the box on the floor near the furnace register. Almondine poked her nose over the side. She wasn't even a yearling yet, still clumsy and often foolish. They were afraid she would step on the pup or press him with her nose and scare the life out of him, and so after a time they put the box on the kitchen table. Trudy tried formula, but the pup took a drop and pushed the nipple away, with four paws not much bigger than her thumbs. She tried cow's milk and then honey and water, letting the drops hang off her fingertips. She found an apron and a broad front pocket and carried the pup that way, thinking he might sit up, look around, but he just lay on his back and peered gravely at her. The sight made her smile. When she ran a finger along his belly fur, he squirmed to keep sight of her eyes. At dinner time, they sat and talked about what to do. They'd seen mothers reject babies in the whelping room, even when nothing seemed wrong. Sometimes, Gar said, it worked to put orphans with another nursing mother. As soon as the words were out, they left the dishes on the table and carried the pup to the kennel. One of the mothers growled at the pup's scent. Another pushed him away and no straw over his body. In response, the pup lay utterly still. There was no point in getting mad, but Trudy did anyway. She stalked to the house, pup clasped between her hands. She rolled a tiny piece of cheese between her fingers until it was warm and soft. She offered a shred of roast beef from her plate. The pup accepted none of these. Near midnight, exhausted, they took the foundling upstairs and yet, and set it in the crib with a saucer of formula. Almondine pressed her nose through the bars and sniffed. The pup crawled toward the sound and shut his eyes and lay with hands and with hind legs outstretched, pads up while the bells in the mobile chimed. Trudy woke that night to find Almondine pacing the bedroom floor. The pup lay glassy-eyed in the crib without the strength to lift his head. She pulled the rocking chair to the window and set the pup in her lap. The clouds had passed and in the light of the half moon the pup's fur was silver-tipped. Almondine slid her muzzle along Trudy's thigh. She drew the pup's scent for a long time, then lay down, and the shadow of the rocking chair drifted back and forth over her. In the pup's final hour, Trudy whispered to it about the black seed inside her, as though it might somehow understand. She, choked, she stroked the fuzz on its chest as its eyes turned to her, and in the dark they made a bargain that one of them would go and one would stay. When Gar woke, he knew where he would find Trudy. Guys, I hope I don't start crying. This time it was he who cried. They buried the pup under the birches near the baby's grave, both of them unnamed. But this newest grave unmarked as well, and now, instead of rain, the sun shone down with the little consolation it could give. When they finished, Edgar's parents returned to the kennel and went to work. Their work, the work that never ended, I've got to get a tissue. Oh my goodness, guys. Listen, I know I didn't cry when she lost the baby, right? I mean, I did. I did. I just kept those tears in there. <sighs> they went to work, their work, the work that never ended. For the dogs were hungry, and one of the mothers was sick, and her pups would have to be hand-fed, and the yearlings, unruly and headstrong, desperately needed training. Edgar didn't learn that story all at once. He assembled it, bit by bit, signing a question and fitting together another piece. Sometimes they declared that they didn't want to talk about it just then, or change the subject trying perhaps to protect him from the fact that there was no happy ending to some stories, and yet they didn't want to lie to him either. There came a day, a terrible day, when the story was almost fully told. When his mother decided to re reveal everything, all of it, start to finish, repeating even those parts he knew, leaving out only what she herself had forgotten. Edgar was upset by how unfair it seemed, but he hid his reaction, afraid she would sugar the truth when he asked other questions. Until then, he thought he understood something about those events, 
about the world in general, that there would be a certain balance to the story, that somehow there was to be compensation for the baby. When his mother told him the pup died that first night, he thought he had heard her wrong and made her repeat it. Later he came to think maybe there had been a certain compensation, though harsh, though it lasted only a day. His mother became pregnant again, and this time she carried the baby to term. He was that baby, born on the 13th of May, 1958, at 6 o'clock in the morning. They named him Edgar after his father. And through the pregnancy, and though it went smoothly, a complication arose the moment he drew his first breath to cry. He was five days in the hospital before they finally brought him home. I'm trying, let me just look and see. I think I can do this. This chapter is called Almondine. Eventually, she understood the house was keeping a secret from her. All that winter and all through the spring, Almondine had known something was going to happen, but no matter where she looked, she couldn't find it. Sometimes when she entered a room, there was the feeling that the thing was going to happen had just been there, and she'd stop and pant and peer around while the feeling seeped away as mysteriously as it had arrived. Weeks might pass without a sign, and then a night would come, when lying nose to tell beneath the window in the kitchen corner, listening to the murmur of conversation at the slosh of and clink of dishes being washed, she felt it in the house again, and she whisked her tail across the baseboards in long, pensive strokes and silently collected her feet beneath her and waited. When half an hour passed and nothing appeared, she groaned and sighed and rolled onto her back and waited to see if it were somewhere in her sleep. She began investigating unlikely crevices behind the refrigerator, where age-old layers of dust whirled in frantic life under her breath, within the tangle of chair legs or living feet beneath the kitchen table, inside the boots and shoes sagging in a line beside the back porch door, none with any success, through, though freshly baited mousetraps began to appear behind the appliances beyond the reach of her delicate, inquisitive nose. Once, when Edgar's parents left their closet door open, she'd spent an entire morning crouched on the bedroom floor, certain she'd finally cornered the thing among the jumble of shoes and drapes of cloth. She lost patience after a while and walked to the threshold, scenting the musty darkness, and she would have begun her search in earnest, but Trudy called from the yard and she was forced to leave it be. By the time she remembered the closet later that day, the thing was gone, and there was no telling where it might have gotten to. Sometimes, after she had searched and failed to find the thing that was going to happen, she stood beside Edgar's mother or father and waited for them to call it out. But they'd forgotten about it, or more likely, had never known it in the first place. There were things like that, she'd learned, obvious things they didn't know. The way they ran their hands down her, down her sides and scratched along her backbone consoled her, but the fact was she wanted a job to do. But then she'd been in the house for almost a year, away from her litter mates, away from the sounds and smells of the kennel, with only the daily training work to occupy her. Now even that had become a routine, and she was not the kind of dog who could be idle for long without growing unhappy. If they didn't know about this thing, it was all that much more important that she find it and show them. In April, she began to wake in the night and wander the house, pausing beside the vacant couch and the blowing furnace registers to ask what they knew, but they never answered. Or knew, but couldn't say. Always, at the end of those moonlight prowls, she found herself standing in the room with the crib, where, at odd moments, she might discover Trudy rearranging the chest of drawers or brushing her hand through the mobile suspended over it. From the doorway, her gaze was drawn to the rocking chair, bathed in the pale night light, that filtered through this curtain window. She recalled a time when she'd slept beside that chair while Trudy rocked in the dark. She approached and dropped her nose below the seat and lifted an inch, encouraged it, encouraging it to remember and tell her what more it knew, but it only tilted back and forth in silence. It was clear that the bed positively knew the secret, but it wasn't saying no matter how many times she had asked. Edgar's parents awoke one night to find her dragging away the blanket in a moment of spite. In the morning, she poked her nose at the truck, the traveler, as she thought of it, sitting petrified in the driveway, 
but it too kept all secrets close and made no reply. And so, near the end of that time, she could only commiserate with Trudy, who now obviously longed to find the thing as much as Almondine, and who had, for some reason, begun to spend her time lying in bed instead of going to the kennel. The idea, it seemed, was to stop hunting for the thing entirely and let the house yield up its secret on its own. There came a morning when they woke while it was still dark outside, and Gar began to rush around the house, stopping only long enough to make two quick phone calls. He threw some things into a suitcase and carried it out to the truck, and then carried it back in again and threw some more things inside, and all the while he did this, Almondine watched Trudy dress slowly and deliberately. When she finished, she sat on the edge of the bed and said, Relax, Gar, there's plenty of time. They walked down the steps together, and Almondine escorted the two of them to the truck. When Trudy was seated in the cab, Almondine circled back and waited for the tailgate to open, but instead, Gar led her back to the kennel and opened the door to an empty run. She stood in the aisle and looked at him, incredulous. Go in, he said. She considered the temptation of the open barn door. Morning light poured in from behind Gar, casting a shadow along the dry, dusty cement floor and over her. In the end, she let him take her collar and lead her into the pen, which was the best she could do. Then there was the sound of the truck starting and tires on gravel. Some of the dogs barked out of habit at the noise, but Almondine was too stunned to do anything but stand in the straw and wait for the truck to return and guard a rush back inside to get her. When she finally lay down, it was so near the door that tufts of her fur pressed through the squares of wire. Dr. Papanel arrived that evening and dished out food and water and checked on the pups. The next morning, Edgar's father returned, but he hurried through the chores, leaving Almondine in the camel run. That evening, it was Papanel again. When the night came on, she stood in the outer kennel run, listening to the spring peepers begin their cacophony and the bats flickering overhead, and she looked at the frozen oculus of the moon as it rose above the trees and cast its blue radiance across the field. It was just cool enough for her breath to light up, and for a long time she stood there, panting, trying to imagine what it was that was happening. Some of the other dogs pressed through the door, doors of their runs and stood with her. The old stone silo loomed over them. After a while, she gave up and pushed back inside and curled into a corner and set her gaze on the motionless barn doors. Another day passed, then two more. In the morning, Almondine heard the sound of the truck pulling into the yard, followed by a car. When Trudy's voice reached her, Almondine put her paws on the pen door and joined in the barking for the first time since she had been out there. Gar came out to the barn and opened her pen. She whirled in the aisle, then bolted for the back porch steps and turned and panted over her shoulder, waiting for him to catch up. Trudy sat in her chair in the living room, a white blanket in her arms. Dr. Papanel was on the couch, hat on his lap. Almondine approached, quivering with curiosity. She slid her muzzle carefully along Trudy's shoulder, stopping just inches from the blanket. She narrowed her eyes and inhaled a dozen short breaths. Faint huffing sounds emanated from the fabric, and a delicate pink hand jerked out. Five fingers splayed and relaxed, and so managed to express a yawn. That would have been the first time Almondine saw Edgar's hands. In a way, that would have been the first time she saw him make a sign. That miniature hand was so moist and pink and interesting the temptation was almost irresistible. She pressed her nose forward another fraction of an inch. No licks, Trudy whispered in her ear. Almondine began to wag her tail slowly at first, then faster, as if something long held motionless inside her had gained momentum enough to break free. The swing of her tail rocked her chest and shoulders like a counterweight. She withdrew her muscle from across Trudy's chest and licked at the air, and with that small joke she lost all reserve and she play bowed and whooped quietly. As a result she was downstayed, but she didn't mind as long as she was in a place where she could watch. Dr. Papanel sat with them for an hour or so. Their talk sounded low and serious. 
Somehow, Almondine concluded that they were worried about the baby, that something wasn't right, and yet she could see that the baby was fine. He squirmed, he breathed, he slept. When Dr. Papineau excused himself, Edgar's father went. That says our hour's up, but we're almost done. He excused himself, and Edgar's father went to the barn to do the chores properly for the first time in four days, and his mother, exhausted, looked out the window while the infant slept. It was mid-afternoon on a spring day, brilliant, green, cool. The house hunched quietly around them, and then, sitting upright in her chair, Edgar's mother fell asleep. Almondine lay on the floor and watched, puzzling over something as soon as Gar had opened the kennel door. She had been sure that the house was about to reveal its secret, and now she would find this thing she, uh, that was going to happen. When she had seen the blanket and sent to the baby, she thought maybe that was it, but it seemed to her now that wasn't right either. Whatever the secret was, it had to do with the baby, but it wasn't simply the fact of the baby. While Almondine pondered this, a sound reached her ears, a whispery rasp, barely audible even to her. At first she couldn't make sense of it. The moment she had walked into the room, she had heard the breaths coming from the blanket, the ones that nearly matched his mother's breathing. And so it took her a moment to understand that in this new sound, she was hearing distress. To realize that this near silence was the sound of him wailing, she waited for the sound to stop, but it went on and on, as quiet as the rustle of the new leaves on the apple tree. That was what the concern had been about, she realized. The baby had no voice. It couldn't make a sound. Almondine began to pant. She shifted her weight from one hip to the other, and as she looked on, she saw his mother continue to sleep. She finally understood the thing that was going to happen was that her time for training was over, and now at last, she had a job to do. And so Almondine gathered her legs beneath her and broke her stay. She crossed the room and paused be beside the chair, and she became in that moment, and was ever after, a cautious dog, for suddenly it seemed important that she be right in this. And looking at the two of them there, one silently bawling, one slumped in graceful exhaustion, Certainty unfolded in her the way morning light fills a north room. She drew her tongue along her mother's face just once, very deliberately, then stepped back to wait. Her mother startled awake. After a moment, she shifted the blanket and its contents and adjusted her blouse, and soon enough, The whispery sounds the baby had been making were replaced by other sounds. Almondine recognized, equally quiet, but carrying no note of distress. Almondine walked back to where she had been stayed. All of this had happened in the space of a moment or two, and though the pads of her feet she could through the pads of her feet she could feel how her body had warmed a place on the rug. She stood for a long time looking at the two of them, and then she lay down and tucked her nose under the tip of her tail. And she slept. Oh goodness, friends. I hope you are totally sucked into this like I was the first time I read it, and I'm so excited to be able to be reading it again with you. Excuse the emotion. I hope you're crying too. I hope you'll join me next time for the second part um, of the story of Edgar Sautel. Have a great day.